The iPhone X is predictably different. It's the first design overhaul Apple's had since the original iPhone, and like Apple itself, it's predictably polarizing. I tend to be pretty agnostic when it comes to mobile OS, splitting my time pretty evenly between whatever Android flagship du jour is out and the large screen iPhone at the time. For me, the iPhone's become a commodity, an entry into iMessage. But with the X, it was the first iPhone since the 6 Plus I was generally pumped about. But now, two weeks in, that initial enthusiasm has started to wane. The iPhone X for me, though, is a tale of two stories. For the first six days, I found it frustrating and oftentimes super annoying. I wasn't starting my swipe far enough down to go home, I accidentally set off the SOS alert trying to turn my phone off, prompting the police to call me back. It was annoying that I couldn't see the battery percentage of swiping down from the right. But then the second week of testing, something happened. I stopped thinking about these UI tweaks and just started using them. After that initial learning curve, I started to really enjoy the phone, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's start back at the beginning. The iPhone X, at least on paper, is a phone that I've been hoping Apple would make. Wireless charging, OLED, badass camera setup, and a design that can finally rival the best of Android. So aside from Apple stealing my hairline for that top notch, at least aesthetically, the phone looks stunning. Face ID sounds like a gimmick, but now two weeks in, I'm still not completely sold, but I'm way more convinced than I was at the beginning. But we'll get to that. I usually skip over software in my iPhone reviews because it's iOS, but with the 10, you can't just pick it up and know what to do. I've been reviewing phones now for over nine years. It's the first device that I can remember where I had to look up how to power the device off. I had to ask how to take screenshots and how to close applications. There's a lot of nuances here. It takes time to learn. But the more I used it, the more I saw that Apple's future, while looking surprisingly like the Palm Pre software, is incredibly bright. The gestures became more deliberate and the swipes became second nature. I still have a hard time understanding why Apple didn't put an on-screen home button or at least something force touch in the dock, but I did at least get used to it. So software aside, the next big story is the 5.8 inch OLED display. And I just want to say thank you. Seriously, finally, and thank you. The 2436 by 1125 make the 458 PPI screen look awesome. In my recent Samsung reviews, I've praised them for their incredible screen technology. And for the 10, Apple cozied up to their frenemy Samsung to build the display, while Apple maintained control of under the underlying tech. So predictably, when those two get together, the screen is incredible, but not perfect. I turned off the True Tone display. I thought the constant re-white balancing was unnecessary and a possible battery drain. It also, to my eye, caused a bit of a yellow hue, but others in the office absolutely loved it, so personal preference thing. Color reproduction is awesome. The wide color gamut really helps with that. And the black levels are very black. That's one of the incredible things about the OLED technology. I was a bit worried about brightness, but with auto turned on, I never felt the screen looked washed out. I never had issues seeing it in direct sunlight. This is clearly the best screen Apple has ever put on one of their devices and can finally rival the best displays from Samsung and LG. Despite having a larger display than the A+, the phone feels noticeably smaller in the hand. It kind of feels reminiscent of a Galaxy S8, and it's only slightly bigger in frame than an iPhone 8. I usually opt for the larger size phones, but it's hard not to admit that this is the sweet spot for almost everyone's hand size. I really love the feel of the phone. The glass on the back feels awesome, and I thought that I lost the feel of the device when I put it in a case, so perhaps foolishly, I made the decision to go case-free and instead opted for AppleCare. It's hard to not feel like a chump after shelling out about 1200 bucks for the phone and the extended warranty. I have laptops that cost less than that. Apple claims the glass on the back is the strongest glass on any smartphone, but when it comes to the accidental drop and the subsequent battle of glass versus concrete, um, I'm going with concrete every time, and the drop tests that we've seen and reviewed tend to confirm the fragility. The band around the side is made of surgical grade stainless steel, and I'm not sure what surgical grade has to do with anything here, but hey, it's, it's there. The space gray version that I've been testing does show plenty of fingerprints, so keep a t-shirt or a cloth handy to clean that sucker up. The speakers here are also 25% louder, and they sound pretty good for a mobile. They don't distort the sound when you go to high volumes, but if you still want better audio, you're gonna want headphones. But make sure those headphones are either wireless or lightning, because still no headphone jack here. 
So I promised I'd talk about Face ID, and in all honesty, I'm still not sure how I feel about it, but how I feel doesn't really matter. It unlocks about as fast as Touch ID, and I found myself having to use a passcode about as often as I did with Touch ID anyway, so I think that's a win. Using it in apps, though, is where it really shines. Things like Apple Pay and 1Password just feel effortless. Camera time. So Apple changed orientation of their 12 megapixel sensors from landscape to portrait, so you know they mean business. It's the expected combo of wide angle and telephoto lenses, and Apple's marketing machine will tell you it uses a state-of-the-art seven magnet solution, but to the end user, the pictures just look really good. Both cameras have OIS, and they do a really admirable job of stabilizing video. Where I think it really shines is in low light situations where the pictures still end up looking really good. Pictures look really incredible without being overexposed, and even in almost no light, I was able to see the true color reproduction in the photos. Another thing I love is portrait mode, and I try and use it almost every chance I get to take pictures of my kids. It just works incredibly well. The True Depth camera on the front enables portrait mode selfies that just looked really bad. Hopefully software updates will fix this, but the background sometimes weren't blurred properly, ears seemed to trip it up, I just wasn't that impressed. But you do get an emojis, which I'm not gonna lie, I use more than a grown man should. The novelty will probably wear off soon, but I love shaking my head and seeing the poo sway, and I can't be alone. Battery life for me was about 10% worse than what I got on my 8 Plus. It's good, but not great. I could get through a full day, so that's at least what I need. And I commend Apple for not going full Apple and creating their own wireless charging standard, instead opting for the pretty much ubiquitous Qi standard. It also rained one day while we were testing, so it was nice to have the IP67. Although obviously I would have preferred the IP68 that's standard now across almost all Android flagships. So that notch, it's, it's there. On one hand, I can see why they did it. It creates two distinct swipes to bring up different things. In this case, control center notifications, and I get that. It also, for better or worse, serves as brand identification for Apple. But when watching full screen videos or apps that aren't yet optimized, it's kind of distracting and a bit of an eyesore. It did start to fade in the background the latter part of my usage, but then I'd watch a full screen YouTube video and I'd be keenly aware that notch was there. I'll say this though, it detracts less than I thought, but it's definitely a slight blemish on otherwise gorgeous canvas. The A11 Bionic is powering the device and it's predictably fast. Sometimes it feels overkill, but I imagine the extra horsepower is there to help the iPhone 10 age gracefully into iOS 12 and 13, which I think are gonna focus a lot on gestures. So the iPhone 10, it's not for everyone in the way previous iPhones were. My mom, for example, has been an iPhone user for five years and took one look at the lack of a home button and said, no, thank you. Face ID and gestures are gonna take time to get used to, not because they don't work, because they're drastically different than what people have had before. The price of having the cutting edge from Apple is a steep one to pay. Starting at a grand, the barrier to entry is crazy high, even for Apple. If you decide you want to come on board, you'll get a device that's finally at feature parity with the best of Android and predictably performs better than any iPhone in recent memory. I can see the direction Apple's headed here, and while not perfect, the iPhone X is definitely top notch. <laughs>